Dear friends, I welcome you to our service today. It is a day we mark the Feast of Pentecost. It is an opportunity to give thanks for the coming of God's power in Holy Spirit on the disciples. And in our prayers, we will take the opportunity to invite this same Pentecostal reality into our lives to be our guide and to work through us to bring Christ's consciousness to the world. Let us pray. O oh God, who on this day taught the hearts of your faithful people by sending to them the light of your Holy Spirit, grant us by the same Spirit to have a right judgment in all things and evermore to rejoice in his holy comfort. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verses 1 to 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them was filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear, each of us, in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, 
both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of the Lord. may seem a little strange on the day of Pentecost to begin this reflection by bringing our thinking back to the story of the Tower of Babel, which is found in Genesis 11. Let me remind you of the scene. People fractured in their relationship with God, losing the plot and building a tower so that they might get as near to heaven as possible, whilst grabbing a bit of fame and glory as they did so. Let us make a name for ourselves, they decide. All sounds rather familiar, doesn't it? Not much seems to change. And together with this thirst and impulse for power was a nameless and underlying fear. They persuade themselves that without the tower, they will be scattered abroad throughout the earth. 
Now, as far as the story tells us, there doesn't seem to be any justification for this fear. We're not told of any threat, but nevertheless, their instinct is to build high and to huddle together. It's ironic that as a result of their actions, the very thing that they had feared actually happens. They are forced to live apart and scattered over the whole earth because they can no longer understand each other or work together. The Lord, we are told, confused their language. Now, why have I begun our reflection here? Well, the story and acts of the day of Pentecost is a rich reversal of the story of Babel. The scattered people come together. They had been used to being separated by language, but now God's own words unite them. The Holy Spirit comes on Peter and the other apostles in a powerful and in a supernatural way. And they cannot even begin to pretend that this is of their own doing. If the builders of the Tower of Babel are guilty of trying to be like God, the disciples are only too aware that they are nothing without God's power. And there is, I think, a great paradox here. God's power and word is made known by simple men, not trained linguists, simple men making themselves heard and understood by an eclectic crowd drawn from all corners of the empire. Over and over again, through scripture and through history, God chooses as his messengers those who seem inadequate and wholly unsuited for their great task. When we look at church history, it is not always the powerful of the church we remember most. If you think about it, think about those who have influenced the church most throughout the generations. I'll mention a few. Francis of Assisi, St. John of the Cross, Julian of Norwich, John Newton, Charles Wesley, Mother Teresa, maybe Dietrich Bonhoeffer. We might ask why the Spirit is not being poured out on the official religious leaders. Why does it start in an upper room with a group of relatively unimportant people? Well, for me, the Spirit seems to be mirroring the ministry of Jesus, who was radically inclusive and seemed to go out of his way to meet all the riffraff rather than the great and the good. And I think this is how God works. This is God, who was not found in the earthquake, wind or fire, but in the small voice. This is the God who quietly arrived on the scene as a baby and who, whose first witnesses were shepherds and pagan astrologers. This is the spirit of the one who we are told uh, said that the first would be last and the last would be first. And as Jesus told Nicodemus, the wind would blow where it chooses and so it is with the spirit. And this is why the story of the Tower of Babel is so illuminating in this context, because it suggests that nothing divides people more quickly from God than a desire for power and a determination to rely on oneself. Those who have no illusions about their own gifts might actually be the only ones who are prepared to turn to God and ask for help. As an aside, it seems to me that whenever the church gets involved with the great and the good at the expense of the common people, it loses its message and its way. Jesus does promise his uh, followers a kind of power. And starting from Pentecost, Acts shows us the kind of great works that the disciples are able to do in the name of Jesus. But the point of this power from the Spirit is to point to the Son and through the Son to the Father and not to themselves. So here at Pentecost, he comes in power, but not in ostentation. He comes to the ordinary. He comes to those who've been with Jesus, his friends and his family. 
It starts there. And I think it always starts there. Where Jesus is, there is the Spirit also. I am struck by the appearance of Jesus to his disciples as recorded in John 20. You might remember it. Jesus comes and he says, peace to be with you. As the Father sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. There's something so personal about that. Something so understated takes us back, doesn't it, to Genesis 2, where we are told that God breathes into human nostrils the breath of life and humankind came alive, alive with God's life. And here in this new creation at Pentecost, the restoring life of Jesus is breathed out through Jesus and the wind of the Spirit blows out across the ordinary Joe and Jane logs. The old is gone as the Spirit ushers in a new beginning. Well, that is all well and good, you may think. What has this to do with us? Well, it reveals that each of us has a part to play in God's new creation. Few, if any of us, will ever get a mention in the great annals of history. But in God's economy, that does not matter. It is the small acts of kindness, the short word of witness. It is the listening ear of a friend and the demonstration of what St. Paul calls the fruit of the Spirit that is truly important. And all of us, without exception, can do this as we are led by the Spirit. Amen. The Pentecostal Prayer God of love, thank you for the wind and fire which brought the gift of the Holy Spirit to the Apostles. Through the same gift, nurture and strengthen us to tell others about all your deeds of power. This we ask in the power of the same Holy Spirit. Amen. We pray for God to fill us with his Spirit. Generous God, we thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit. We ask that we may be strengthened to serve you better. Lord, come to bless us and fill us with your Spirit. We thank you for the wisdom of your Holy Spirit. We ask you to make us wise to understand your will. Lord, come to bless us and fill us with your Spirit. 
We thank you for the peace of your Holy Spirit. We ask you to keep us confident of your love wherever you call us. Lord, come to bless us and fill us with your Spirit. We thank you for the healing of your Holy Spirit. We ask you to bring reconciliation and wholeness where there is division, sickness and sorrow. Lord, come to bless us and fill us with your Spirit. We thank you for the gifts of your Holy Spirit. We ask you to equip us for the work which you have given us. Lord, come to bless us and fill us with your Spirit. We thank you for the fruit of your Holy Spirit. We ask you to reveal in our lives the love of Jesus. Lord, come to bless us and fill us with your Spirit. We thank you for the breath of your Holy Spirit, given us by the risen Lord. We ask you to keep the whole church living and departed in the joy of eternal life. Lord, come to bless us and fill us with your Spirit. And now the words of the ninth century hymn, Veni Creata Spiritus. Come, Holy Ghost, our souls inspire, and lighten with celestial fire. Thou the anointing Spirit art, who dost thy sevenfold gifts impart. Thy blessed unction from above is comfort, life and fire of love. Enable with perpetual light the dullness of our blinded sight. Anoint and cheer our soiled face with the abundance of thy grace. Keep far from foes, give peace at home. For thou art guide, no ill can come. Teach us to know the Father, Son and thee, of both, to be but one. That through the ages all along, this may be our endless song.
and we conclude our service with a final prayer and blessing. Let us pray. Faithful God, who fulfilled the promises of Easter by sending us your Holy Spirit and opening to every race and nation the way of life eternal, open our lips by your Spirit, that every tongue may tell of your glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. And may the blessings of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among us all, now and forevermore. Amen.
and don't be afraid. 